In this week's update, the CPI was good news, the Fed statement was not. The ECB talks tough as well, and volatility is really making life tough for investors. But it was options expiry week. My name's Gary Davis. As always, this is general advice only, and please remember to like and subscribe to the video. What a fascinating week. Um, we The market finally got what it was hoping for, and that was some good news uh, with the CPI data. But um, Jeremy Powell came in on um, on Thursday and uh, pretty much upended the apple cart, that was for sure. So CPI good, but Powell really well and truly blew up the tent with um, with the statement and the press conference. Um, there are many aspects to what he said, but here's, here's the key ones. Um, and they did, you know, what was expected at the interest rate rise front, and that was to only go up 0.5% instead of the prior 075 So that was in line with market expectations. But what the market didn't want to hear was that um, the terminal rate, and the American now is 4.25 to 4.5. That's where the current cash rate sits. Um, and he elevated the, the likely peak in interest rates up from 4.6 at the previous statement to 5.1. So that's not what the market really wanted to hear. And also indicated that um, they would continue that higher uh, rates for longer, despite the fact that they're now predicting the GDP would slow from 1.2 at the last report to now down to 0.5. So they're acknowledging that um, you know that things are going to slow, and and therefore there's no prospect really of a pivot in uh, in the short term. And the market's been accustomed for the last five to eight years of any time the the equity market got a bit of a wobble, then the Fed would go weak at the knees and they would reverse policy. And it was you know it was been called the the Greenspan put and the Penanke put and, and, you know, the, the market always felt that there was, that the Fed would ride to the rescue and, um, and, and uh, you know, keep the equities market buoyant. But it's now extremely obvious that that's not going to happen. And that's really not the message that the market had priced in with this bounce in the last few weeks. So what we've got now is the, in a way, the worst scenario the Fed intent on raising uh, rates um, until they can see that they're on a clear pathway back to 2% inflation. And if a recession is part of that, and, and they're, they've actually said, <coughs> I beg your pardon, they've actually said that they require higher unemployment. Unemployment needs to go up. So they seem very intent on slowing growth dramatically, raising unemployment and, you know, that just can't be good for general equities profitability. And I don't suspect that that is fully priced in. So, you know, one really just needs to recognise the landscape. And that is that at the general uh, index level, you'd have to say that the pathway for the indices is, is still, you know, pressure on to the downside. Because I don't think the scenario that Powell has outlined is is probably priced in. It might be, but I severely doubt it. So I would expect in the next uh, little bit that we're going to see the indices go lower. But before you get the razor blades out, um, just think back about what's happened this year. You know, energy has done remarkably well in America. Renewable energy has done really well. Lithium stocks have done really well. And there's a few other isolated areas that have done really well. So just because the index is going to go down, you know, don't fret about it. Just as I'll deal with later on, just, just get organised and, um, and utilise the opportunities that come from this. So the overall is that the Fed remains absolutely fixated on inflation. Um, and if a recession is the result of their actions, then, you know, so be it. Now, people for the last few months have been raising the issue that they should slow down, they should pause and see what lag effects can come through. Um, but judging on Powell's statement on, um, on Thursday, it just 
doesn't appear that they're going to do that. They're going to keep the, the pedal to the floor until they actually see the CPI data come down, the, the official inflation data come down. Even though there are plenty of, um, let's call them sub-indicators, that, that show quite clearly that inflation, um, the rate of inflation increase is slowing. So... Um, yeah, it's going to be um, it's going to be an interesting period, and and more than that, you know, the bond market, which is a far more professional market than the equities market, um, the bond market says that um, you know that the effects of the rate rises that have been made have got us pretty close to peak inflation. So I'll come back to that. Now, the other part of what the Fed's doing, of course, that's not getting very much media attention. Uh, from what I can see, is that the quantitative tightening, the withdrawal of liquidity from the market, they're, they're pulling about $100 billion a month out of the market through through tightening. Now, everyone probably remembers what quantitative easing looks like, and that's the Fed buying, buying bonds, um, you know, at a massive level to to keep, um, keep interest or keep yields down. Well, that's all been reversed as well, along with the... Um, so not only are interest rates going up, which has a dampening effect, but they're also pulling liquidity out of the out of the market at a at a fairly significant clip as well. So what Powell actually said, um, cooling inflation would require a sustained period of below trend growth. You know that's not great for company earnings in in general, and this may bring some pain to households and businesses. So that's you know that's code for um, well, not so not so much code. It's pretty clear that they're expecting you know things to be restrictive for a while. So stock selection is just critical. You know, having a d- diversified portfolio across all sectors um, is all well and good in a raging bull market, but not in this kind of market. So what does all this mean for investors? Um, reflecting back on 2022, it was it was an incredibly difficult period for a couple of reasons, because we were never sure whether we'd reach the bottom. And, you know, what what would the Fed do? Would the Fed pivot? Would they go to water as they have done over and over again in the past? And so from my perspective, the most difficult thing about 2022 was the uncertainty of the landscape. We just couldn't be sure what would come next. And so much of the market action was um, dependent on on Fed statements and Fed decisions, which, you know, could have gone either way. So to me, that was that was the difficulty of 2022. It was you could never be sure whether there was another leg down. And we were in that position on a couple of occasions. We had on multiple occasions, you know, bad news equals good news. You know, bad economic data was construed as good because it would mean that less rate rises and that was good for equities. And it also went the other way. So it's it's impossible to play that game, particularly if you're a short-term thinker and a short-term trader. But from my perspective, what, what Powell has now made obvious, so he had all the justification in the world with the CPI data coming in the, the day before, as it did. He had all the ammunition to, to back off and to, to issue, you know, do the half percent rate rise, but go a bit easier on the outlook statement. You know, be, be a bit more mushy about what they're going to do with future rates. You know, he, the data gave him that flexibility and he didn't take it. So to me, that makes it, you know, very clear about how things are going to be in the way forward. And, you know, I, to, to a certain extent, I, I don't really mind whether markets go up or down. I just, you know, I just want to be, I want to feel confident about the steps that I'm taking, that they're likely to have follow through. And I think we've been given that in in a way now. So I actually think 2023, I feel more comfortable now with the outlook for 2023 than, than I did during most times in 2022. All right, now what if things deteriorate more than expected? Um, you know, what if earnings, you know, the February earnings season in America? What if that falls flat? What if a lot of companies miss expectations? Um, The same with GDP. You know, what if the growth slows more dramatically because the lag effects start to kick in? 
You know, what if inflation starts to tick up again? You know, what if in, in unemployment starts to go up quickly? What impact does that have on the consumer? You know, it, it doesn't seem to have worried the consumer too much, either in Australia or in America so far, uh, because we haven't really had that high unemployment. But, you know, what if unemployment kicks up? What impact does that have on the general economy? So a lot of things can, you know, can still change. So if that happens, I think at the index level, a sharp fall is quite likely. Um, but, you know, we'll just play that as it comes. But if it happens, it'll set up a terrific long-term entry opportunity. You know, that's, that's the key message. We're facing cycles like we've never faced before. Um, you know, this is really a brave new world. People chuck that, um, that expression around a bit, but it really is an in incredibly different world that we're in now. And so there, there isn't a playbook that we can fall back on. And so therefore, the only way to negotiate is be absolutely clear about your process, focus on the sectors that are working, forget the rest. Um, and because there's enough opportunities within the narrow sectors and industry groups that have done well and probably will continue to do well. And risk management is essential. In fact, it's more than essential. It's absolutely critical. <clears throat> you know, every transaction you make, you can pre-plan 90% of the decision points. You know, you, you're not a victim of what the market throws at you. You don't have to accept, you know, whatever, whatever waves are going to wash over the top of you. You can think it through before you actually enter a transaction and anticipate what your, what your reactions might be and, and you can manage your risk in that way. But you've heard that message repeatedly through 2022 and in probably for the last five years. All right, let's look at American stocks now. The S&P lost 2.1% for the week, but it was options expiring. And Thursday and Friday, I would absolutely bet my life on the fact that there was a significant degree of market manipulation that was happening. Um, you've just got to look at some of the strongest stocks um, in the two or three months leading into this week that, um, you know, some of them seem to be irrationally sold off when they've been trending high and, and many stocks that had been weak, um, you know, either managed to hold their ground or a couple even went up. So uh, just reeks of market manipulation to me. So therefore, don't place as much emphasis in, in the charts for the last week and particularly the last couple of days. And, and I'd also point to the, to the VIX and the 10-year yield responses to the CPI and the Fed to, you know, to validate that um, because you know, th those results were quite surprising and we'll have a look at those in a minute. The US dollar index uh, was roughly steady, didn't really move much, but the yield uh, went down to 349 and um, you know, that's a surprise. You would have thought after Powell's statement that the 10 year yield would have would have gone up and, and gone up sharply, um, but it didn't. So the bond market is saying that they they just don't believe that the Fed is going to need to raise rates, that the lag effects are going to kick in and the Fed won't have to go as high as they think or as high as they're indicating at the moment. And also the VIX remained remarkably stable despite the equities market falling. It remained stable um, at around 22 and a half. Now the spread, 10 year, two year spread contracted a little bit. There's still a high likelihood of a recession. And again, that's another reason why I think the index is going to be under pressure. Um, some sectors will do well, but the index will be under pressure. So let's jump in and take a look at some charts. I just want to look at a couple of the US sector charts first, because, you know, they do pretty much dictate what's happening the, the rest of the around the rest of the world. So the important thing here is just to look at the red line, the 200 day moving average, where the shorter term moving averages are in relation to that and where the price is in relation to all those moving averages. And it, you've got to say that, you know, energy remains the standout sector in America. If we look at, at um, healthcare, healthcare has had a really good couple of months 
and is now back into the positive and the 200 day moving average is now starting to turn up. So long term, it had reached a point of st stability. Short term, healthcare probably the outperformer of, of the last uh, month or two, even better than energy. So that one is, um, is quite positive. If we look at finance, now finance, you can see the 200 day still, still down. Um, we had some short term uh, better performance from that sector, but it's still looking like it's really just sideways and basing. But if we drill down within finance, which is a pretty um, you know broad sector, and look at the the top performer, and this is um, the in full line insurance index, and you can see if you compare that chart, look at the 200 day moving average and where the price is, and look at that chart, you can see that clearly this industry group, and this is one of about 15 industry groups within finance has done significantly better. So that's why I keep pounding on about, you know, don't look at things at the overall index level. It's just it's just giving you the wrong picture. Go and find the industry groups and the individual stocks that are doing best and just do that. You know, this is not a complicated formula. And if you then drill down within this full line insurance index, you would again find a very significant divergence between the best performers and, and, the, and the rest. So you can, you can move from, you know, if you just look at the finance index and make a conclusion, then you're just missing wonderful opportunities. This is technology still struggling and, um, you know, there's still an area to be very cautious on and there's not a lot happening really at the at the uh, industry group level either. So I'm not getting very excited about technology yet. This is an important chart. This is semiconductors. I talk about this every week and the importance of semiconductors to the overall bullish sentiment coming back. And this is a long term chart. So this is going back uh, nearly 10 years. And I've also put it on a log scale to make this trend line a little more obvious. And you can see that the semiconductor sector has been trending uh, higher for, um, for a long period of time, in fact, throughout the last decade. And that this trend line has pretty much dictated um, this, the long-term support. Now, we recently you know, breached that for a week, but you know, that's neither here nor there, and we've bounced. But we've still got lower highs and lower lows. So we are in a medium term downtrend. So this peak up here is the start of um, 2022. So we're still in medium term downtrend. And if this line were to break and be sustained for more than a couple of weeks, then that wouldn't be very nice. It's not, it's not what I want to see. So I'll be watching this chart and showing this chart uh, each week um, you know, quite, quite closely because, you know, this is one of the more important charts. Just for the record, if we look at, um, I'll just have a quick look at this. So this is the overall, this is a, um, a monthly chart uh, going back to uh, 1967. And you can see that, you know, my, my overall big picture is that we're still in a um, secular bull market. You know, a secular bear market is one where you fail, you get, you get deep declines, but you fail to form new highs. And we saw that from 2000 to 2012, 13. But at this point in time, we are still forming higher highs and higher lows. So we remain in a secular bull market. And there's just no other way, despite what some bearish people might, might want, um, there's just no question that this is a secular bull market. And if you look at the cycles over time, you know, typically somewhere between 18 to 20 years is the, the length of time for the cyclical bull market, which takes us out to about 2031. So, you know, that's the reality of the big picture. Now, within secular bull markets, of course, you, you can and do get significant falls. I mean, look here, this is 1987. You know, one of the most famous crashes of all time happened within a secular bull market. 
uh, it's not to say that we don't get painful periods, but what we do get is if we've got all of our processes sorted out, it's and you, perhaps your timing isn't all that all that spot on, then you know you just you just wait a bit longer, and and in secular bull markets things recover. Let's look at it on the uh, on the daily chart though. You can see we managed to rally back to the 200. Had a couple of little looks over the top, but not sustained. I wouldn't get too concerned about the volume on um, Friday night because it was options expiring. But you've got to look at this chart and conclude that we're still forming higher highs and higher lows and we can't break through and sustain below or above the 200 day moving average. So, you know, that's just the, the reality of where the S&P is at the moment. All right, let's go to the important spread charts, show us where the, where the money is going and not going. Uh, this is the NASDAQ 100 versus the S&P. We, we might be forming a base. So we've, we've stopped forming lower lows. So that's something. But you know, again, I'm not, getting, I'm not getting excited by the fact that we've got a bit of stability. Um, it's still a work in progress. Small cap growth versus small cap value. It certainly does appear that you know this is forming a base and so at least money now is not rotating preferentially into small cap value so you know people are prepared to to invest in small cap growth and that's a good sign again on a weekly chart to give us a bigger picture this is a large cap growth versus large cap value it's, it's a bit like the nasdaq versus the s p it's you know, it's possible we're at the bottom, but you, you wouldn't be claiming it yet. So that's still a work in progress. This is semiconductors versus the S&P. Um, I said last week or the last couple of weeks that I really want to see us get up above this ratio here, about 1.73. We're currently at uh, 1.6. So we, we need some further gains for the semiconductor sector. Um, that's for sure. So we're not out of the woods there yet. Consumer discretionary versus staples. I think I'm, I'm sort of ignoring this chart at the moment because, you know, Tesla is getting severely beaten up. Elon Musk sold um, a lot of shares or a great dollar value of shares. And Tesla and Amazon make up 40 percent of this index. So we've got a we've got an artificial drag on consumer discretionary. So I'm not placing a lot of emphasis on on that one in the in the shorter term. And this is mid cap versus the S&P, which is telling us, you know, pretty much the same story as, as the small caps. So they're all the, um, they're all the really key uh, charts to, um, to observe. Um, all right, we'll come back to, um, we'll come back to gold. Now, just uh, looking at the currencies, there's the US dollar, didn't really do much for the week. And if we look at the Australian, dollar pretty much mirroring what the US did. So we've managed to rally back to um, to the 200 day, but starting to fall away again. And I suspect now with Powell's statement that the US dollar, you know, may start to find some support and may even work its way back up a little bit. Um, but I did say that I was going to show you, I almost forgot. So given the Fed statement and the way the market reacted, you would have thought that the VIX would have kicked up a lot more. So let's take a let's take a bigger picture view of what the VIX has done this year. So we started the year down around 16, and we've bottomed out a couple of times just below 20. But we had a number of spikes above 30, one, two, a sustained period here for you know, another sustained period here. So we've been above 30 on multiple occasions, which is, you know, pretty much reflective of the market that we've had. But I would have thought with the Fed statement, that the VIX would have been something like 27, 28. And uh, if you look at what actually happened over the last week, we actually finished with the VIX closer to the lows of the week. And yet Thursday and Friday saw concerted selling in the equities market. So there is an inconsistency there. It's you know it's saying that you know maybe maybe in the equities market it's just you know it's the indexes are not really 
showing what the rest of the market is is really doing with their money. And if we look at if we look at the um, the U.S. Treasury yield again, let's go and look at the whole year to date. So yields rising, which everybody knows, of course, we peaked out around 4.3. But look where we are now. And, and we've been trending down now since so these dual peaks. This was uh, October and then early November. So we've been trending down now for about six weeks. Um, and if you zero in on the actual on last week, you know, what happened on Thursday and Friday when the equities market was sold off, then, you know, this is surprising. We're almost on the lows. And that, that is not consistent with what we're seeing. So the bond market is, is sending a very, very different signal. And I would never dismiss the bond market as, as being wrong. The bond market is right more often than the equities market is right. So, you know, that that is saying really that there is, you know, perhaps some some better times ahead for equities purely on the basis that the rate rises aren't going to go as high. Because if the bond market honestly thought that the Fed was going to continue through and push rates above 5%, then why would the 10-year yield be trading at 3.45? You know, just ask yourself that logical question. Okay. Have a quick look at the at the ASX 200 and the, and the sector indices there. So here's here's where the ASX 200 is. <clears throat> we're at the same level that we were at pre the COVID crash. <coughs> Big pardon. Um, and really, we're also at the same level that we were at in May of 2021. So the index has really gone nowhere. But if we look at the individual sector level. Then obviously, you know, energy had a pretty solid year, not as good as US energy, but still not too bad. Finance is at the same level that we we're at pre-COVID crash, almost exactly. Uh, healthcare, let me pan back a bit further. Healthcare is actually trading uh, lower than where we, where we were pre-COVID crash, and that's because a lot of the Healthcare majors were trading on, you know, pretty high PEs that have been washed out to a degree. And this is the material sector. And it's trading above the pre-COVID levels, the pre-COVID crash highs. So, you know, materials and energy. Energy, number one. Materials, number two. And, you know, there's there's no other way to read the Australian market. You know, that's that's it. That's the very clear message. So to summarise, 66.18 is where our dollar finished. 0.9 across the week was the uh, was the fall. Um, but um, other than those two specific sectors, the overall ASX 200 is just sitting around the same as, as the pre-COVID highs. So a fully diversified portfolio is struggling. You know, it really is. And when you factor in inflation, then you're actually losing ground. Precious metals. Gold eased by $4 to seventeen ninety three, um, And it's still sitting in the middle of the, that range from seventeen fifty to eighteen thirty, and and not really showing anything to my mind that it's going to break out of there. Um, the... The US dollar, sorry, the Australian dollar gold price rose a little bit, $20 or $30 to $27.08. But if we look at stocks, if we look at GDXJ, so the global, uh, the global index, and, and that includes, <clears throat> you know, whilst it's called J GDXJ, J for junior, it does include stocks like Northern Star, which in the Australian context is hardly a junior. Um, so there's still no leadership from, um, from stocks at the global level, um, but locally we've been outperforming for the last three months. And um, let me just show that chart. So we we'll just check the the spread charts for um, for gold. Uh, so that's gold versus the US dollar. So we're we're back. Oh, sorry, gold versus silver. So silver has had a, a pretty good time of it in the last few weeks. 
this is um, GDX versus gold, and we're stuck. You know, we're down about we're down around 0.17 on this ratio. Now the long-term ratio is somewhere around about 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.45. So gold on a long-term historical level, gold stocks are significantly cheaper based on history. Uh, but at the moment, and for quite some time, that situation is not showing any signs of changing, and I still don't, I don't see it. And in fact, we're actually getting lower highs and lower lows on the ratio. So that means that gold stocks, as a general statement, continue to do worse than the gold price itself. All right, the final chart I want to look at, and this really underscores it. So this is GDXJ, so the, the global index. And I've just put, you know, one of my favorite um, gold producers uh, in Northern, Northern Star. So you can see that particularly over the last couple of months, Northern Star has done significantly better than the global index. And if we add in the actual gold price itself, you can see, so this clearly shows you GDXJ underperforming the, um, the gold price. But Australian stocks, particularly a producer like Northern Star, has significantly outperformed the gold price. So that chart pretty much, you know, clearly says, you know, what I said on the, the last slide about how the gold market sits. Turning to other commodities now, copper uh, eased a little bit. Um, 3.76, um, nickel 12.97 also down a little bit. I guess this is just a reaction to, to you know, to Powell's statement, which raises the prospects of, um, of a global recession. So I think that's the response we're seeing here. But the longer term reality is that the copper market remains very tight in, in terms of supply versus demand. Inventories are very low. <coughs> so it's hard to see the copper price going down, but longer term, it's very easy to see the copper price going up. So from a pure risk reward point of view, you know, the, the equation is very much in favor of copper stocks. And the pathway to, uh, to significant deficits that, you know, BHP in particular has talked about is, um, is set to continue. Crude oil, um, up a little bit, up about three dollars to seventy four fifty, uh, and finished mid range for the week. So that was the the commodities market. Now, one thing to be aware of, and I, I suspect that unless something other factors dramatically change this, uh, you know, something geopolitical, that the U.S. has Biden has stated that the U.S. Strategic Reserve, where the the um, the uh, strategic reserve of oil in America that was sitting at about 700 million barrels of oil but has been drawn down to about 400 million. Um, you know, that's got to be rebuilt. And they've said that the range that they will rebuild will be between 67 and 72 from memory. So that means that every time the crude oil price gets down into that range, the US is going to be buying oil to rebuild their strategic reserves. So that, that doesn't guarantee that 67 becomes the floor, but it certainly helps. There's the spot copper chart and the spot nickel chart. So not a lot of change uh, across the week. So wrapping it up, and this will be the last, um, the last video this year for obvious reasons, next Sunday being Christmas Day. Um, not sure when, when the first video of the new year will um, We'll come back in uh, again. It won't be New Year's Day, but quite possibly the um, the second Sunday of um, of January. The lessons from 2022 and the opportunities for 2023. I mean, everybody does that at this time of the year, so I might as well have a little bit of a bit of a kick at it as well. Um, what I am producing uh, is a very in depth members video on the the way that we manage things during 2022, um, what what turned out well, um, you know, what didn't work so well, and therefore we can use that as a lesson and take into 2023. And it's having done that review, in, just increased my enthusiasm and excitement about 2023. 
um, because for the reason that I said earlier at the start of the video, and that is that I think in many ways, what Powell said on, on Thursday has actually clarified the way forward, you know, rather than continued the uncertainty. I, I feel more comfortable now with, with uh, you know, what I've got ahead of me. So that uh, members video is, um, is going to be coming out in the next 24, 48 hours. Um, so, if, you know, if you're not a member of either the Insiders Club or Portfolio Analyst, then, you know, there's an opportunity to, uh, you know, to get a very good big picture view of what happened and what we can take into 2023. The reality is this, and a lot of people forget this, you know, when, when you've been smacked around the ears uh, repeatedly during the year, as has happened in 2022, is, it, you know, you can get a bit despondent, a bit you know, what, why bother kind of attitude. But you've got to remember that highly volatile markets and, and, you know, bear markets always, always create terrific opportunities. And, you know, you've only got to look at just the energy sector, just recall the energy chart. It consistently rose above, uh, you know, form new highs and new lows throughout the year. Yeah, there were a couple of sell-offs, but those sell-offs created tremendous opportunities so so just focus on on those so you can either feel frustrated or you can just get yourself organized get clear about what you're doing and go for it um you know they're they're the two choices and i know which one i'm going to take the other point that came through and i've had a few questions in the last few months that suggest to me strongly that a lot of people don't have a consistency between their plan and their investing time frame so they might be using they might be using a signal generated on a long-term basis but their plan is you know is not consistent with that so you just want to make sure that you're not using you know one style of signal to get into the market and then trying to use a different style of signal to get out of the market because you know because you you get put off your game when there's a bit of volatility. So I think that consistency is, is important. Portfolio Analyst last week um, was about using the mining cycle to advantage. And particularly with development stocks, there is a very, very significant and volatile cycle, but you can use that to, to great effect. You know, times not, definitely times not to buy into, into development stocks and other times that are just wonderful opportunities and, and you know, Five and ten baggers can result if you um, can use learn to use that mining cycle to to best advantage. All right, that's it for 2022. Um, I wish everyone a, a very um, safe and and um, happy Christmas, and certainly a prosperous 2023. There's more information on the website. As I said, if you haven't tried the um, the Portfolio Analyst Trial, a dollar for two weeks, uh, or the Insiders Club, which is just a month by month subscription, then, um, you know, it's it would be a very good time to do so. You know, you'll have time over, um, you have time over the Christmas break if you're so, uh, so inclined to, um, to go through this video. And I think it will provide a lot of clarity uh, around how to manage the opportunities in, in 2023. So wishing everyone well, and I'll be back with you in the new year. Cheers.